Hi, I'm James Barrett. I'm with the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, and I'm here to present to you a sales and use tax return preparation. In this seminar, uh, we're going to teach you how to create a username and password for full access to our new system, how to complete a basic sales and use tax return, and how to electronically file and pay that sales and use tax return. Uh, we have a service for getting it in writing. Uh, we want to make sure that you go to our website, uh, cdtfa.ca.gov forward slash email to get your tax questions answered by professionals. Uh, we will provide you with legally actionable tax advice that we are obligated to respect. So uh, you can go there and get your help. Uh, so we have a new website. It's been there for a while now. A lot of the utility on the website is behind the username and password. If you're able to get a username and password set up, uh, you're going to be able to register a new business activity, close locations or add locations, update ID numbers. You can request payment plans, cancel draft returns, request refunds, uh, request relief from penalties. You can also view account balances, see your past history and past returns, request to go paperless, uh, once you have your username and password set up, a good deal of your account maintenance can be done online. This is an easy two-step process. Uh, the first step is you need to request a security code from us. We will mail you a physical copy of the security code in five to ten business days. Uh, we are also able to give it out over the phone if you call us at our customer service center, 1-800-400-7115. Once you have your security code, you can come back and register for a username and create a password. When you go to our website, that website is cdtfa.ca.gov, you'll see in the black bar across the top a button that says Login, which you will want to click on. The Login button will take you to our Taxpayer Online Services portal. You can select File, Pay, or View at the top of your screen. Uh, it will all go to the same location, which is our new website. And when you see the photo of Lake Tahoe in the background, you know you're in the right spot. The first step is down here underneath Username and Password. You see Create a Username and then an option for Sign Up Now. And you can click on that. Clicking on Sign Up Now brings you to this page asking how you are related to the business you're requesting to manage. If you are the owner of the business, meaning you are on the seller's permit, you can select owner and hit next. If you are a third party delegate, such as a, an employee or a CPA or bookkeeper, it's going to direct you to create your username and password first. Then once you are logged in, you can click the link that says request access to an account and finish getting a security code. But in this situation, if you are the uh, business owner, you say yes, and then uh, here, security code, have you received a letter in the mail? You will say no and hit next. On this page, you're going to put in your identification type. Uh, this is going to be the information we have on file for you, uh, driver's license or social security. Then on the second line, you're going to type that in along with your last name and first name. A middle name is optional. Then you're going to select your account type. If you have a seller's permit, that is sales and use tax. So you're going to want to scroll through alphabetically to find the sales and use tax account type. And then you will type in your account number. And then you'll just go ahead and hit submit. And this will give you a confirmation. The letter arrive, should arrive within 10 business days. If you're on the phone with us and we can verify your identity, we'll give you the number right away. Either way, you're going to hit I'm done. And once you have the security code, you're going to come back here and click Sign Up Now one more time. Since we're doing this for a business owner, you're going to say, I am the owner of the business, and hit Next. This time you're going to say, yes, I have a security code, and hit Next. It's going to prompt you to fill in the security code. You're going to do your identification type and number one more time, last name and first name one more time. Select your account type, that would be sales and use tax for a seller's permit, and your account number one more time, and then we'll hit next. Now we're going to go ahead and create a username. Your username can be anything, all one word, as uh, long as it's not already taken, no special characters. 
uh, and you'll put that in twice. The password has to meet all of these rules on the right here. So it has to be a minimum of eight characters with letters and numbers, uppercase and lowercase letters, and it has to have a special character like an exclamation point. Uh, it's going to ask you to type that in twice as well. Uh, if any of those fields pop up as red, that means there's a problem and you may need to uh, come up with a new idea. Then we have the secret question. Uh, you're going to select a secret question. What was your first concert? Where did you meet your spouse? Something like that. And type in the secret answer below. Once you've filled this out, uh, you'll hit next. And it brings us to contact information. This is to contact you with information about your account. So you want to use your email and a phone number where we can reach you. This is also the information that we'll use to reset your password if you forget. All right. So you can put in your email twice, select your uh, phone type, and type in your phone number and hit next. Now we're on another page that requests an email and a phone number. That's because this is for two-step authentication. When you log in from a browser for the first time, uh, you will be prompted to input a code which we will send to either your email or your phone number on file. That's to make sure that this is an authorized login from a new browser. You will have the option to click remember this browser and it won't ask you the next time. Uh, but for this time, uh, you can use the same email if you would like and you will need to use a phone number that gets text messages. You can also select to go only email or only text message if you wanted. Once we filled this out, you can hit submit down here at the bottom. It says I'm done. And then you can click here to put in your username and password that you just created. Once you have done that, you can hit login. This is where it prompts you for the authentication code, which will be sent by email in this circumstance. In a 20 seconds, you'll get that email. You can type in your authentication code. You can click yes, trust this browser and log on. And then uh, you can be as happy as she is with her account. All right. When you log in, uh, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see your information here. You're going to see flags showing any outstanding balance or outstanding returns. If you logged in as a third party access, you're going to come over here on the right underneath I want to and click request access to an account. This is important. So if you're a bookkeeper, you can come here and click request access to an account. Put in the seller's permit numbers for each customer that you want to have access to. And then we'll get you the security codes and you'll see them all lined up down here at the bottom of the screen. In this case, we have Mr. Bob Smith and his one seller's permit down here. All right. So in addition to the request access to an account, you can also see we have request payment plan, file and or view or return, manage business activity, change your legal name, items like this. Across the middle, we have accounts, submissions, correspondence. You can see letters that we have sent to you, things that you may have missed in your mail. And you can also update your names and addresses this way as well. So once you have your username and password set up, it's time to gather your information that you need in order to file a return. Now for most businesses, this is going to involve getting your total gross sales. Now what we want for total gross sales is everything that your business sold. That's whether or not it's taxable. Okay. Uh, it does not include sales tax that you collected from your customers. It's understood that you sold X amount and you've got sales tax collected on top of that. We're just interested in the sales themselves. You also want purchases subject to use tax. These are items that you purchased online or out of state without paying sales tax uh, for use by your business or yourself. These are also items that you took out of inventory which you purchased with a resale certificate. In either of those situations, you want to keep records so that you can report them on your sales tax return. You're going to gather information related to your deductions and exemptions. And then you're also going to need information related to sales tax subject to district tax. So we're going to go through this scenario here with uh, Bob's Bikes. So Bob Smith runs Bob's Bikes in Los Angeles, California. 
Bob has a fairly successful store, and for this period, he sold a total of $100,000, which includes bicycles, parts, and labor for repair. Repair labor is not taxable, while assembly labor is. Bob removed a bicycle from inventory and gave it to his son in Los Angeles. Uh, the bicycle cost $2,500 and was purchased by Bob without paying tax by using a resale certificate. So you know that he owes use tax on that. And since it was used in Los Angeles, the use tax is at the Los Angeles rate. Bob sold bicycles and parts in the amount of $20,000 to Billy's Bicycle Store. Uh, Bob has a resale certificate on file. So because he has a resale certificate on file, that is documentation that this is a non-taxable sale. Bob charges for bicycle repair and labor, totaling $1,500. Now, repair labor is not taxable. Neither is this $2,000 uh, of a tactical bicycle that he sold to the U.S. government. And in addition to this, he's going to have uh, various uh, documents on file. So he's going to have sales receipts showing repair labor charged. He's going to have canceled checks showing non-taxable sales to the federal government. He's going to have shipping documents showing that these $21,000 in sales were shipped out of state and thus are not taxable. Now, for location information, Bob used his own truck to deliver bicycles totaling $2,000 to Orange County. Since he's in Los Angeles, but he's shipping by his own vehicle to Orange County, he has a business nexus there. And these $2,000 need to be declared at the Orange County rate. Bob uh, made $49,000 in sales at the Los Angeles County store, which of course would be at the Los Angeles County rate. Bob then used UPS, which is a common carrier, to ship 4,000 of bicycles to San Francisco. Since he is not engaged in business in San Francisco and shipped by common carrier, those are sales that are subject to only the state rate of 7.25%. For the purposes of this practice tax return, we will assume Bob does not meet the $500,000 threshold for sales in California. Businesses that sell over that threshold are required to collect district tax based on where their customer accepts delivery, but Bob is under that threshold and is only responsible for the state rate. And finally, uh, Bob used his own truck to deliver bicycles totaling $3,000 to Ventura County. Now, because Bob is using his own vehicle, he has a business nexus in Ventura County. However, Ventura County doesn't have any district taxes. They only charge the state rate of 7.25%. Even though he would be subject to district taxes in Ventura County, since he's delivering by his own vehicle, there are no district taxes. So Bob went through and created his username and password. He comes over here and types it in. Select your sales and use tax return. Now, if you're an individual who has a use tax permit, you want to make sure to click the second option here. It says use tax return. If you click sales and use tax return, nothing's going to show up. If you have a use tax permit only, you're going to click use tax return. Otherwise, Bob was click sales and use tax return. He can put in his customer ID that he has on file. That can be his uh, FEIN or his social security number, driver's license, and the account number. Bob created his username and password. So he logs in and he can come over here and click file and or view of return. Alternately, you'll see an, an alert, a little orange flag that he can click on, and that'll take you straight to the sales tax return. The first time you file a return, you're going to see this page here, business activities. Did your business conduct any of the following? Do you sell motor vehicle fuel? This is a checkup on your business activities. You're going to answer yes or no, and then hit next. For those of you who have filed before, this will be the first page that you see. This is page one of the sales tax return. So as you can see, Bob sold bikes, parts, and labor amounting to $100,000. So this is total gross sales, taxable and non-taxable sales of $100,000 goes in line one. 
Again, that doesn't include sales tax return. In Bob's case, I know how this ends. He's got about $5,300 in taxes collected on top of the $100,000. Bob removed that bicycle from his inventory and gave it to his son. It was worth $2,500, and he owes use tax on that. So down here, purchases subject to use tax, items removed from inventory for business or personal use, and he types in $2,500. Down here, total sales and purchases, $102,500. The gray boxes are populated automatically. If you see an error in a gray box, it's because of something you put in the white box and you need to go back and correct it. Once Bob has put in his total gross sales, and his purchases subject to use tax, you can click Next. On this page, we want you to report sales made at state-designated fairgrounds. If you made sales at a state-designated fairground, you can report it here. Otherwise, you can leave it zero, and we'll hit Next. Now, this is the deductions page, or the non-taxable sales page. In this situation, we know that Bob sold bikes and parts worth $20,000 to Billy's Bike Store, and he has that resale certificate on file as proof. So the line one is sales to other retailers for resale. And you can type in 20,000 there. Now line two is non-taxable sales of food products. If Bob were to sell bananas to his bicyclists, he would put the sale of bananas there, but we don't have any sales like that. He did charge $1,500 for bike repair, which is a non-taxable labor. So that's line three. Non-taxable labor, repair and installation, he types in $1,500 there. He sold $2,000 to the U.S. government, so that would be line four. Sales to the United States government, $2,000. You can see it in red. He shipped via UPS $21,000 bicycles out of state. Those are not taxable because they went out of the borders of California. So down here, you have sales in interstate or foreign commerce of $21,000. So this is $44,500 in uh, total deductions. Line six here is sales tax included in gross sales. If that $100,000 number on the first page included sales tax, you would want to put it here to avoid being taxed on the sales tax you collected from your customers. We also have other deductions down here. If you sell through consignment, marketplace facilitators, if you do construction contracts, you can click here and it'll show you a drop down and you can select the option that applies for you. You also have an option to select other and write in a description. You want to make sure that when you claim non-taxable sales, you have the records necessary to back it up. Your sales for resale uh, will need a resale certificate on file from your customer. Non-taxable food or labor will need to be backed up with invoices or cash register tapes showing those charges. Sales to the U.S. government will need canceled checks or similar records showing a direct purchase from the federal government. Sales out of state or out of country can be verified with shipping documents. And for sales tax and gross sales, you will want to keep a record of your calculations used to tabulate the amount as well as your normal records of sale. So for Bob's bikes, he's going to click Next. Now we do have tax recovery adjustments. These are things such as bad debt allowances, cost of tax paid purchases resold prior to use, return taxable merchandise, cash discounts on taxable sales. Down here we have partial tax exemptions for timber, teleproduction equipment, other items like that partial tax exemptions for manufacturing and research and development. These are all available to our taxpayers. For Bob, he doesn't have this option down below here. You see that his, in this one, the other deductions has an extra section down here. That's because Bob is filling out our EZ form. If you are a taxpayer that needs recovery adjustments or partial tax exemptions, and you don't see this section on your deductions page, you're going to need to give us a call. Again, that number is 1-800-400-7115. And we'll switch the return that you're filling out so that you can have access to these boxes. But Bob does not have that. 
He has 44,500 in deductions, no adjustments or exemptions, so we're going to go right on along. This brings us to our Schedule A district tax allocation. This can be confusing. What we see up here is taxable transactions to be allocated below 58,000. This is the 102,500 in total sales and purchases minus the 44,500 in deductions gives us 58,000 for which we need location information in order to assess the proper sales tax rate. Now Bob used his own truck to deliver $2,000 of bicycles to Orange County. So this is already pre-filled, but what you would do at home if you're putting in a new uh, county, you see this white box here. If you click in this white box, you'll see a drop-down of counties in California. So you would select Orange County. Then underneath City, you would click in this white box. What you would see in that drop-down is a list of every city that has a higher tax rate than the county. If you don't see the city that you're looking for, then you're going to select the Orange County unincorporated rate. You may see multiple options for the unincorporated rate. In the drop-down, you will see it say unincorporated, and then in parentheses, effective date with a day, week, and month, or it might say expired date. You will want to select the one that applies to the period for which you're filing. We keep old rates in there for people filing past due returns, so you want to make sure you're selecting the one that applies to the period of your sale. In this scenario, Bob selected Orange County, Orange County Unincorporated, effective date, and underneath taxable amount, he put in $2,000. That tells us those $2,000 were uh, delivered by his own vehicle, so he is subject to the Orange County rate which is a district tax of about a half a percent. Again, the gray areas are filled in automatically. Then he sold $49,000 out of his store in Los Angeles County. So again, Los Angeles County, he doesn't see the city he's in, so he selects the Los Angeles County unincorporated rate, and he types in $49,000, which is the 2.25% district tax rate for Los Angeles County. In addition, Bob sold $4,000 of bicycles shipped via UPS to San Francisco where he had no business nexus. He also sold $3,000 of bikes to Ventura County and even though he delivered it in his own vehicle, there is no district tax in that portion of Ventura County. So he has $4,000 and $3,000, all of which are subject to the state rate of 7.25%. That's what this line is at the bottom down here. Transactions subject to only the state rate of 7.25%, not subject to district tax. And he puts all $7,000 in that line. So if you're following along, $49,000 at the LA rate, $2,000 at the Orange County rate, and $7,000 only subject to the state rate, which equals the $58,000 in taxable transactions to be allocated. What we're looking for down here is the amount remaining to be allocated should be zero, and that means we can click next. Tax prepayments. If you are a permit holder required to make prepayments, you're going to see those numbers showing up here. If you see zero, that could mean that you didn't make your prepayment or it was mislabeled, in which case you should call us to make sure it was received. Again, the number is 1-800-400-7115. If you did not make your prepayments, you will see this slide. This slide says tax payments verification. It asks you if you had taxable transactions. If you had no taxable transactions during the first month of the quarter, you would say no. That would tell us that you didn't have to make a prepayment because you didn't have sales. If you did have taxable transactions, you would need to say yes. And same thing for the second month of the quarter. Bob's Bikes doesn't make prepayments, so it's all zero. We'll hit next. Now on this page, this shows us $5,318 in sales tax due. This page can give people sticker shock. I just want to make sure people know this number does not include any credits or exemptions which you have claimed. This is just the total amount of sales tax due based on sales. On this page, you're also supposed to declare any excess tax collected. 
if you collected extra tax by mistake, if there's extra tax because of a rounding error, something like that, you either need to refund it to your customer and keep records, or you need to drop it in here and it'll go into the state general fund as an excess tax collected. Bob's Bikes only collected the right amount, 5,318, so he leaves excess tax collected as zero and hits next. This is the page where you see credits and exemptions. So 5,318 is due. He didn't have any credits or exemptions, but you would see them listed here. Uh, you can also see total tax prepayments. If you made prepayments, they will be on this page. And then the remaining tax is the amount that is due today. Bob owes all 5,318. He is filing and paying on time, so there is no penalty. There is no interest. The total amount due today is 5,318, and then he hits next. On this page, you're going to put in your first and last name as the preparer. Uh, you're going to need a title. You can put owner, you can put bookkeeper, wife, husband, employee, something like that. You're going to put in your telephone. If you're not a paid preparer, meaning a CPA, a bookkeeper, you'll say no, and then hit submit. If you logged in with your username and password, it'll ask for your password as a signature. Once you've hit OK, your return will be filed. So make sure if you need to double check it, you do it before you get to this point. This page here shows that you have filed your return and filed it electronically. Now this is a two-step process. This shows that you have filed your return. Now you need to make a payment. If you hit I'm done at the bottom, you'll be able to log into your account later and make a payment if you wish. You will want to print your return here if you need. You will have to turn off your pop-up blocker. Pop-up blockers will stop the PDF from appearing. Otherwise, you can click make a payment or print a payment voucher. If you hit print a payment voucher, you will see this once you have turned off your pop-up blocker. All right, Bob's Bikes can go ahead and print this out. It's got our period, the account number, and the voucher type, which is return payment. And close that with this check and send it to this address here. If you click make a payment, it'll direct you to this page. Now you can pay electronically using your checking or savings account on the left. You can pay by credit or debit on the right, but the credit debit does come with a 2.3% fee for our outside vendor that processes the payment. So do keep that in mind. If you select checking or savings, it brings up this page here. You can select your bank account type, uh, business checking, business uh, savings, personal checking, personal savings. You can type in your routing number. If you have your checkbook in front of you, the routing number is usually the first group of numbers on the bottom of your check. Once you put that in, your bank name should appear, telling you you got it right. Then you'll put in your bank account number, and you'll need to do that twice to make sure you've input it correctly. The bank account number is usually the second group of numbers on the bottom of your check. You will also have the option to save this payment for future use, so you won't have to put it in each time. All of this over here should be automatically generated. It'll be your return payment. The payment date is set to today. You would be able to click the calendar icon and select a date in the future. As long as the date is processed by the end of the filing period, it will be on time. And then you will have to type in your confirmed payment amount. In Bob's Bikes case, 5,318. Then you hit submit. It's going to ask for that password again as a signature and then you'll have paid your taxes. If you select the credit card option, uh, it's gonna take you to this page. You can hit the blue button that says enter credit debit info. It pulls you away to the outside website where you can select the terms and agree to the 2.3% convenience fee. You can put in your card information and hit continue where it'll bring you back to us. You can finalize the payment. Once you've hit this page, you're done. This means that you have filed previously, you've seen this page when you filed, and now you've seen it when you've paid. Okay? And you can hit OK. If you need more resources on how to file, or you need more help with your taxes, we have online resources. You can come to our website, which is again cdtfa.ca.gov. You can hit online services, and then select the tab which says resources. All right? And once you see that, you'll see frequently asked questions, special notices and video tutorials. 
Also, uh, I want to invite you again to call our customer service center. We have the ability to hop on the website with you and follow along and help you fill out your tax return. That number is 1-800-400-7115. Thank you for watching today. Uh, we wish you success in your business venture. Thank you.